Hey, hey, here we are again with A Pinch of Magic by Michelle Harrison. We are up to chapter 14. So excited to read this to you. I am not a professional voiceover actor or reader. I am just an everyday mama who loves her kids and is sharing the art of writing through reading. So I'm honored to be reading this to you. I hope you've gotten to visit your library or local bookstore and maybe found a treasure of your own. So why don't we get to this treasure by Michelle Harrison. Thanks, Michelle Harrison, for letting us read this book. And this is chapter 14. It's called Escape. Tie him up, Colton gave a hollow chuckle. You're just like your granny, you know that? Betty's right, said Fliss, finally recovering her wits. Your chances are better if we delay the warders, realizing you're gone. And if they notice Jared's missing, at least they'll be searching for him and not you. Then let's hurry. We don't know how long we've got before he comes around, said Colton. He stepped around the unconscious Jared, watching him as if he were a coiled snake ready to bite. We should lift him onto the bed like he's sleeping, said Betty. Her knees were shaking. There was nothing she wanted to do less than approach the meaty figure, let alone touch it. However, the idea of him grabbing any of them the way he grabbed Charlie was driving her forward, forcing her to act. They'd caught Jared off guard at once. She doubted they'd get the same chance twice. After he's tied up, Colton replied. Someone in another cell along the corridor coughed. Then a voice grumbled. Who's whispering to themselves? Pack it in. Someone else laughed. Low and mean. <laughs> Maybe it's five one three crying in his sleep again. Crying in his sleep, Betty glanced at Colton, but he avoided her eyes, a muscle in his jaw twitching. When she'd first met him, cocky and uncooperative, in the visiting room, she couldn't have imagined him crying into his pillow. Seeing him here, afraid, changed things. For the first time, she cared that Colton was getting out. She darted over to the bed, grabbing the sheets. She handed the corner of one to Colton and the other to Fliss. Quickly, tear those into strips. She took a corner and began to pull at the wooden edges. With Fliss tugging one side of the sheet and Betty gripping the other, they tore a long strip as thick as Jared's arm, wincing as the fabric cut into their palms. Colton tore two more, grimacing. We need to bind his hands, knees, and ankles as well as gagging him. He said he worked quickly, his eyes never leaving Jared. Next to the older, powerfully built man, he looked very young. Betty raised an eyebrow. That's thorough. Hey, this was your bright idea, Colton snapped. He kneeled at Jared's side, his nostrils flaring with heavy breaths. He touched Jared's chest softly, then prodded harder when there was no response. Is he really dangerous? Charlie asked, backing away a little. Colton nodded grimly. Betty looked up. There she asked exactly what Jared was capable of. No, she decided. There was no point in scaring them all further, although her imagination was unhelpfully making terrible suggestions. And not just about the prisoner who was unconscious. More dangerous than you? Colton glared at her. Yes. Suddenly, Charlie swooped on something glinting on the stone floor. My tooth! You knocked a tooth out when you landed, Colton asked, surprisingly concerned. Charlie shook her head, pocketing it. No, I just carry it with me. It must have fallen out of my pocket when I landed. I call it Peg. Right, Colton said, slightly mystified, then shook himself. Let's do his legs first. He took a strip of the sheet and wound it around Jared's ankles before tying a firm knot at the bank. At the back. Is that too tight? Fliss asked. Nope, he'll be furious about this. Colton gave a mirthless chuck. You don't want to see him mad. You really don't. Hopefully, we won't have to, said Betty, but the sheen of perspiration on Colton's forehead was making her twitchy. How had he coped in here all this time? Already she felt as though the tiny spaces were closing in, becoming airless. She couldn't wait to get out. Roll him onto his front. It's best his hands are tied behind him. In the corridor, the muttering had become a drone of voices that Betty had been unable to tune out until now, but it was getting louder, more insistent. The prisoners knew there was something going on. Doors began to rattle. Hurry, said Colton. Their noise will bring the warders. They crouched beside the unmoving Jared, grabbing handfuls of cloth. 
they heaved, grunting with the effort. It's like trying to shift a fallen tree, Fliss gasped. Eventually, they maneuvered him onto his side. Now set him down gently on his front, Colton warned. They began to turn him, but before Betty knew it, Jared's weight pulled them forward, and he landed heavily like a slab of meat. Colton rolled his eyes. Ugh, if that's your idea of gentle, I'd hate to see rough. Fliss gagged, covering her nose as a smell of stale sweat wafted up from Jared. Colton smirked. That's prison for you, princess. It ain't pretty. Fliss glared at him. I can see that for myself. To Betty's surprise, she grabbed Jared's hands and held them together as Colton twisted another piece of the sheet tightly around Jared's wrists. All three of them jumped as his thick, sausage-like fingers twitched, then curled. Colton reared back, dropping the sheet. The hands slowly moved, forming a fist before relaxing and becoming limp again. Colton crawled forward warily. We don't have much time. He'll come around soon. Want me to bash him over the head? Charlie asked. She looked around, searching for a suitable weapon. No, Fliss said, shocked. Charlie shrugged, looking suspiciously like she was enjoying the drama. Betty, on the other hand, was not. She was starting to wonder whether adventures agreed with her at all. She felt neither bold nor brave. Colton looped the sheet around Jared's wrists again, knotting it tight. Betty slid a length of sheet just above Jared's knee. He let, a low, he let out a low moan. Forget his knees, Colton said shakily. Let's get him on the bed before he wakes. Betty held up a final rag. Mustn't forget the most important one. She jammed it between Jared's teeth and tied it between his head. Behind his head. With that, the three of them heaped Jared onto his back again, then got into position around him. Lift, Colton said through gritted teeth. The muttering of the other prisoners swelled around them, becoming a low chant. Colton, Colton. Colton, lift, Colton repeated, and somehow, with the chanting in their ears, their rising panic lent them strength, and they threw Jared onto the narrow bed. His eyes flew open as he landed. Fliss picked up the rest of the sheet from the floor and tossed it over him. He writhed underneath it, but the bindings held firm. The clang of a door echoed through the corridors, and the warders were coming. Colton turned to Betty, wide-eyed. Now can we go? Gladly, Betty answered, trying to organize her thoughts over the din of prisoners' voices. The last thing she wanted was Colton and Charlie, and the bag, getting separated from her and Fliss. Colton, you hold on to Fliss, then I'll link arms with Fliss, and Charlie can go to the ends, so she has her arm free to work the bag. You're letting the kid use the bag? Colton asked in astonishment. It has to be her. So that's why you don't want me holding on to Charlie, said Colton slowly, in case I let go of Fliss. Right, Betty answered bluntly. You haven't earned our trust yet. Maybe that's about to change, but for now, I'll stick with being careful. Privately, she wondered whether they should have insisted Colton be tied up too, but they hadn't the time now, and the warders were coming. And though she was unsure of Colton, she didn't feel the same threat from him that she did oozing from Jared. She hoped she wasn't wrong. The other prisoners' voices were belting out Colton's name now, as loud as they could, and so fast that there was barely a breath between the words, Colton, Colton, Colton. Then it broke, giving way to je loud jeers. Sharp, authoritative voices rang out across as the prisoners blurbled. The warders, Colton whispered, they're here. Betty, Charlie's voice was panicked. Get in line, Betty instructed. But Betty, I've lost Hoppet. Then he'll have to stay lost, said Betty in exasperation, bundling Charlie into place. Her little sister's fidgeting made sense now. I can't believe you brought that rat with you. I told you to get rid of it. I didn't mean to. He was in my pocket, Charlie protested. He can't sleep otherwise. They couldn't dash their escape for a silly rat. Everyone ready, Betty said abruptly. Charlie, take us to lament. Charlie's bottom lip wobbled. Not without Hoppet. We can't leave him in this awful place. I'm sure he'll get... Be right at home, said Colton dryly. Quickly, Charlie Fliss urged the bag. Charlie's lips stopped quivering and began to jut obstinately. I said no. We have to look for him. She began to bend down, but Betty took her arm firmly. Firmly. No, Charlie. We leave now. We can't let the warders find us. Look, Fliss gasped, nodding to the bed. There on the sheet, covering Jared, was a small, dark shape. Was scuttling along, sniffing interestedly at the sweaty bulk underneath. Hop it! Charlie exclaimed. She tried to squirm away, but Betty held her fast. Something was happening. Jared shifted under the sheet, groaning like an angry bull. Through the cell door, 
Mrs. Bars came a glow of an approaching lantern. We have to go, Betty whispered desperately. No, Charlie thrashed, but there was no way Betty was letting her near Jared, who was now grunting and writhing. For crow's sake, Colton broke away from Fliss and lunged for the rat, just as the creature vanished into a dip into the sheets between Jared's knees. Got it, he grimaced in disgust, but with those words, Jared's thighs snapped shut, trapping Colton's hand. Colton's eyes widened with shock as he tried to pull himself free, but he was no match for Jared. He was stuck like a fox in a trap. Footsteps scuffed the stone door closer still, the lamplight growing brighter. Colton wrenched at his hand again, but Betty knew from his expression there was no way Jared was letting go, at least not in time. Grab him, she yelled to Fliss. Then to Charlie, go for Crow's sake. And as Fliss lunged for Colton, Charlie plunged her hand into the traveling bag. Lament, they landed on soft, damp grass, the smell of sea salt and earth. Betty's legs crumpled beneath her, and her arms were yanked in both directions, forcing her to release Fliss and Charlie. She sank to her knees, feeling wetness seep through her skin. Her relief at escaping was crushed by dread. The warders would know now that Colton was gone. They should have just left immediately. A bellowing Jared signaling the escape from the confines of his cell was much better than a broken-out Jared, even if he was tied up. Betty dragged herself up, her eyes everywhere, anxious for her sisters. A small copse of trees surrounded them. Charlie had landed neatly as a cat and was staring around, wide-eyed, and her hair more like bramble bush than ever. Betty's eyes rested on Jared, who was lying face down, squirming. Angry grunts came from behind the gag as he struggled against his constraints. Fear prickled her skin like icy raindrops. They had tied him tightly enough, hadn't they? A short distance away, Fliss had landed on top of Colton in a tangled heap. And there I was, thinking you didn't like me, said Colton. You wish, Fliss growled, but the color in her cheeks deepened. She rolled off of him, flicking her hair in his face. Colton grunted as he clambered to his feet. He cast a wary glance at Jared and then stared up at the star-sprinkled sky, his eyes dancing in the moonlight. Faint squeaks came from his outstretched hand, but Colton was too entranced with his new freedom to notice he was still holding Charlie's squirming rat. It's so big, he murmured at last, so vast. I've forgotten how huge the world is outside of the prison walls. Better make sure you don't end up back on the wrong side of them, Betty retorted. Her eyes darted across the wide, flat expanse of Lament. All she could see of mainland Crowstone was were gossamer threads of light in the distance. She had only been to Lament twice before to lay flowers and feathers on her grandfather's and mother's graves. It was the farthest she'd ever been from home. If the escape had gone smoothly, Betty would have been thrilled by this, but now the thought of home appealed more than she wanted to admit. The only excitement she felt was for what Colton was about to reveal. A blast of freezing wind blew in her face. She remembered now how open and flat the land on Lament was, how little shelter there was. It was so empty and mournful here. When they were younger, Fliss had wanted to continue bringing flowers to Mother's grave, but Granny had discouraged them. Better to remember her as she was in here, she said, tapping her head, rather than reminding yourself of where she is now. Fliss, Charlie whined, pressing into her. I know this is an adventure, but does it have to be so cold? Fliss pulled her younger sister closer, though she was shivering herself. Betty stepped in front of them. We won't be out here much longer, Charlie, she said, looking at Colton pointedly. Well, we got you out. Now it's your turn. Tell us how to break the curse. Colton turned to look at her as an expression changed, becoming uncomfortable. He lowered his gaze, shifting from one foot to another. Already, Betty knew with a sinking feeling that she was not going to like whatever she was about to hear. Soon, I still need your help. Betty's eyes narrowed to slits the size of rice grains. Why was he stalling after all they'd just been through? She stalked over to him, temper flaring. You said once we got you out of prison, you could do the rest. That was the deal. There's a boat hidden in one of the caves, Colton said. He looked up at the glittering stars, then across the marshes to the lights on the mainland. I thought I'd be able to get my bearings, but he's struggling with directions, Betty thought. It wasn't surprising. She had heard that long spells in small places could do strange things to the mind. 
Even Betty, who'd spent hours studying all her maps, was finding it more difficult to navigate than expected, now that she was here. If she hadn't been so annoyed, she might have felt a pang of pity for him, but the thought of the curse pushed her sympathy aside as her earlier doubts sniggled. How much did Colton really know? Can you tell us how to break this curse or not? Fliss asked stonily, evidently thinking the same. Or are you just stringing us along? Colton met her eyes for a second, then broke away. Give me to the caves, he muttered. Then I'll tell you everything I know. You were supposed to tell us now, Betty said. You're breaking your word. Why should we do anything else for you, Fliss added. Because if we don't, we'll have wasted our time, Betty said in a hard voice. It was an unbearable thought to have risked so much for nothing. If Colton didn't give them the answers they needed, it was back to groveling fingerty, which held no guarantees either. Charlie marched up to Colton, glaring with as much disdain as she could muster. She held out her hand. My rat, she said icily. Oh, Colton was shamefaced as he handed back the wriggling brown creature. Here, I wasn't planning on keeping it. Huh said Charlie, pocketing Hoppet. So you ain't a thief then, just a liar. She turned on her heel and rejoined her sisters. We'll get you to the cave, said Betty. Then you tell us. No more stalling. What do we do about Jared, though, Fliss asked, jerking her head over the shoulder. Leave him there for the warders to find? Betty glanced back at the copse of trees where he landed. She stiffened, scourging the ground. We might have to worry about that, she whispered. A short way in front of them, squelched into the mud, was a torn piece of rag. It's loose and fluttering, as if waving cheerily. Jared was gone. Ooh. Whoa. Oh. Well, that was the end of chapter 14. I cannot wait to read chapter 15 with you. So, I hope if you're going to bed that you have the sweetest dreams. And if you're about to start your day... I hope you have a good rest of your day, and I will read to you later. Thanks so much. Bye for now.